Good evening aspirants, I have an announcement regarding your prelims preparation. See clearing prelims is a mammoth task for many, but why you worry when you have Shankar AS Academy? Our pre-storming program is aimed to facilitate this process. Pre-storming is the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankar AS Academy. Already two batches are going on successfully. Now for those who have missed to enroll in these batches, a third chance is awaiting. Yes, pre-storming batch 3 is starting on November 9th. The first test in this batch will commence on 20th November. Like the other batches, it will also have 66 tests. So go and register today to enhance your prelim score. With this happy note, now let us move on to the Hindu news analysis for the date 5th November 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. You can go through it. Without much delay, let us get into the article discussion. See this article here, this is the article from yesterday's newspaper and this article talks about Amur Falcons. See the Nagaland is now undertaking the first aviation documentation exercise. It is planned to be conducted for 4 days that is from November 4th to 7th. See the 4 day bird count will coincide with the post harvest Toku Emang festival of the Lodas. Know that the Lodas are the Naga community people who are mostly present in Oka district of Nagaland. Note that the Oka district is the most preferred stopover of Amur Falcons while they are travelling from East Asia to Southern Africa. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about Amur Falcons. See, the Amur Falcon is a type of small raptor which belongs to the genus Falco of the family Falconidae. The scientific name of the Amur Falcon is Falco Amurensis. See, it breeds mostly in southern parts of Siberia and in North China. Amur falcons migrate in large numbers and during migration, the Amur falcon covers a distance of about 22,000 kilometers, thus making it one of the longest distances covered by migratory birds. See Amur falcons while migrating from Siberia to South Africa, it flies through India. Know that it migrates to South Africa to spend the winter there because the winter is more severe in Siberia which endangers the survival of the bird. Then after crossing India, it flies over the Arabian Sea and arrives in South Africa. Mostly they feed on insects in the mid-air. See the dragonfly migration also coincides with the migration of Amur falcon over the Arabian Sea. Hence they turn out to be a most important source of food for Amur falcons. See during migration through India, it stops in Nagaland, parts of Assam and Manipur. Know that Nagaland is known as the falcon capital of the world. Nearly 1 million Amur falcons roost every year in Nagaland. That's why it was declared as the falcon capital of the world by the ornithologists. Particularly the Doyang Reserve which is located in Pankti village in Oka district of Nagaland is one of the most famous places where Amur falcons roost during their stay in India. See these birds roost in Nagaland for a span of one month. Know that these birds also help in maintaining the ecosystem by feeding on a large number of insects and that puts a check on the population of insects. Now talking about characteristics, it weighs about just 150 grams. See the male birds are mostly grey in colour and the females are having orange underparts. This is all about Amur falcons. Now talking about the conservation of Amur falcons, see these birds are placed under the category of least concern in the IUCN's red list of endangered species. Also note that Amur falcons are protected under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and it is included in the Schedule 4 of the Act. It is also listed in Appendix 2 of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species and it is also protected under Convention on Migrated Species which is also called as Bond Convention. Now we will see some facts about Bond Convention. See Bond Convention is an intergovernmental agreement signed under the auspices of United Nations Environment Programme. It focuses on the protection of migratory species on a global scale. Note that India has joined the convention in 1983 and is currently a party to the convention. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about Amur falcons, its characteristics and finally about the conservation status of Amur falcons. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It reports that the two cities of UP that is Vrindavan and Madura are aiming to become a net zero emission tourist destination by 2041. See Vrindavan and Madura are one of the India's largest pilgrimage centers which are present in western part of the Uttar Pradesh. The government officials said 
द गोल ऑफ नेट जीरो एमिशन इज अचीव बै बैनिंग टूरीस्ट वेहिकल इन द रीजियन अंड ओनली एलक्ट्रिक वेहिकल will be used as public transport into the area they also said all 252 water bodies and 24 forests in the region will also be revived this is about the crux of the news article in this context let's learn about the most important environmental terms net zero emission carbon neutral and also about carbon negative now first let's see about carbon neutral we will discuss this term by taking example of one city let's take delhi we can say that delhi city is carbon neutral if carbon or co2 emissions let out by the delhi is equal to the carbon sequestration by the delhi here the word carbon sequestration means the process of capturing and storing atmospheric carbon dioxide note that the term carbon neutral refers only the carbon dioxide and not other greenhouse gases so this is all with respect to carbon neutral now moving on to the term net zero emission see net zero emission is also acting in the same way to the principle of carbon neutrality but it is expanded in scale than carbon neutral that is beyond carbon dioxide it also includes other greenhouse gases that are being emitted into the atmosphere which includes methane nitrous oxide and other hydrofluorocarbons to say simply net zero refers to the balance between the amount of greenhouse gases produced and the amount of gases removed from the atmosphere see the net zero emissions can be achieved when any remaining greenhouse gas emissions released by human activities are neutralized by removing all greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere so this is all with respect to net zero emissions now let's see about carbon negative see carbon negative refers to the removal of more carbon from the atmosphere than the amount of carbon we emit see this can be done by reforestation programs moving from fossil fuels based energy production to renewable energy based energy production changing our consumption patterns etc here note that our neighbor bhutan is a carbon negative country more than 70% of the country is covered with trees and the large amount of tree cover has seen bhutan becoming a carbon sink country note that bhutan absorbs roughly 7 million tons of carbon dioxide annually and only produces about 2 million tons of carbon dioxide annually so bhutan is termed as carbon negative country so this is all with respect to carbon negative that's all regarding this discussion through this discussion we came to know about the environmental terms carbon neutral net zero emissions and finally about the carbon negative with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this editorial page article here it speaks about the postal ballot system the article says that currently the election commission of india allows enrolled overseas citizens of india or non residents indians to vote in person they will vote at the polling station in the constituency where the person is registered as an overseas elector know that the option of a postal ballot system is still not applicable to them in 2020 the election commission of india approached the central government to permit overseas citizens of india to vote via postal ballots and the government is still in the process of deciding on such matter know that currently the postal ballot system is used by service voters During elections the service voters cast their vote through the electronically transmitted postal ballot system which is shortly known as ETPBS so this is the crux of the news article in this context let's learn about the electronically transmitted postal ballot system see electronically transmitted postal ballot system which is shortly called as ETPBS is one of the type of postal ballot system here the postal ballot will be transmitted through electronic means to the voters and it enables the voters to cast their vote on an electronically received postal ballot which is also called as e ballot see with the help of e ballot the voters can cast their votes from their preferred location which is typically outside their originally assigned voting constituency so this system is seen as an easier option of facilitating voting and it has removed the increased time constraint for dispatch of postal ballots know that the electronically transmitted postal ballot system is developed by the election commission of india with the help of the center for development of advanced computing cdac it is a fully secured system and it has two layers of security firstly otp is required to download an encrypted electronically transmitted postal ballot file and secondly pin is required to decrypt print and deliver electronically transmitted postal ballot so the secrecy and security is maintained here also know that every e ballot will have an unique qr code so the possibility of duplication of votes through the electronically transmitted postal ballot is neglected here the class of electors who are eligible for etpbs are the service voters here note that the service voters are those who are serving in the armed forces of the union 
then those serving in the forces to which the army act of 1950 applies that is forces of assam rifles central reserve police force border security force indo tibetan border police shastra seema bal national security guards border roads organization central industrial security force etc and next those employed in a post outside india under the government of india for example ambassadors of india and the members of an armed police force posted outside india so these are all some of the examples also know that under section 20 of the representation of people act 1950 the wife of a service voter who ordinarily resides with her service voter is considered as an ordinary resident of her original constituency therefore the provision of eligibility for electronically transmitted postal ballot system is also extended to the wife of service voter here note that the husband of a lady service voter is not eligible to use this option of postal ballot under the rp act that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about electronically transmitted postal ballot system then about its security and finally about the service voters with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about the china's beidou satellite system the news is that china is going to expand the global reach of beidou satellite navigation system see this move is to create an alternative to the usas global positioning system so to achieve this goal the chinese government is now engaged in the process of strengthening its regional cooperation with organizations such as asean the african union the league of arab states and the community of latin american and caribbean states know that the beidou satellite navigation system now has a constellation of about 30 satellites in orbit it began its international outreach in 2018 and it is now in use in more than half of the world's countries for example saudi arabia is using beidou in surveying and mapping then for positioning people and vehicle in the desert then tajikistan is using beidou to monitor dams and lakes with precision then lebanon is using beidou at beirut port for marine survey and construction also know that china and russia have signed a strategic framework on their two navigation systems that is Beidou of China and GLONASS of Russia. This agreement is to take forward a 2015 deal on interoperability between two satellite systems. Then, if you see Beidou's application in China, it includes the use in guiding drones, autonomous cars in agriculture and forestry. Then, it also helps in providing satellite-powered message for smartphones. And Beidou also helps in connecting remote areas even in the absence of ground reception. Okay, this is all about news article given here. In this context let us discuss about the global navigation satellite system and let's see about some of the applications of global navigation satellite system first of all what is global navigation satellite system see it is a network of satellites that gives broadcasting timing and orbital information then it is used for navigation and positioning measurements here the multiple groups of satellites known as constellations broadcast signals to master control stations and the users of global navigation satellite system across the planet know that global navigation satellite system has three segments that is space segment control segment and user segment now let's see them one by one let's first take up the space segment see the space segment describes the global navigation satellite system constellations orbiting between 20000 to 37000 km above the earth these satellites broadcast signals that identify which satellite is transmitting and its time orbit and status or health also know that there are four main constellations in orbit above the earth they are gps of usa glonass of russia galileo of european union and the beidou of china and in addition to this we have two regional systems they are qzss of japan and irnss of india just have a look at this image to know the different constellations and their details and also look at this table to know the difference between the various constellations now moving on now we will discuss about the second segment that is called control segment see it is a network of master control data uploading and monitoring stations located around the world see these stations receive a satellite signal and compare where the satellite is and where the satellite should be the operators at these stations can control the satellite's position to correct or alter their orbital paths For example if a satellite has drifted or needs to be moved to avoid debris collision the control station does it then the control station also monitors satellite's health and it also helps to ensure a baseline of accuracy in global navigation satellite system positioning this is about control segment now talking about user segment 
it includes the equipment that receives satellite signals. See this segment includes the user's antenna to identify and receive good quality signals. Also it consists of high precision receivers and positioning engines that process the signals and resolve potential timing errors. And this is all about the segments of global navigation satellite system. Now moving on to see the applications of global navigation satellite systems. See its applications rely upon satellite signals to complete their task efficiently and accurately. These applications range across many different industries from agriculture to automotive to defense. But generally it will fall into five major categories. Now let's see them one by one. Firstly take location. The global navigation satellite system helps in determining your position in the world. Secondly navigation. It helps in identifying the best route from one location to another. Then thirdly tracking. See the global navigation satellite system helps in monitoring an object's movement in the world. Then fourthly mapping. It helps in creating maps of a specific area. And finally the fifth category timing. See global navigation satellite system helps in computing precise timing within billions of a second. For example farmers need consistent routes over the fields to optimize seeding, fertilizing and harvesting. So they rely on global navigation satellite system for their location and tracking of their equipment. Then in some cases farmer may use satellite systems to map their fields before planning their routes. Then in the automotive space vehicles use global navigation satellite system for location and navigation purposes. Then in the case of autonomous vehicles the tracking becomes even more very important to continuously monitor potential hazards in the environment. So these are all some of the applications of global navigation satellite systems. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about global navigation satellite systems, their segments and finally about its applications. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the extraordinary powers of Supreme Court. The news is that the Supreme Court upheld the employees pension amendment scheme 2014. The Supreme Court had used its extraordinary powers under article 142 to upheld the amendment. See the judgment will now allow the eligible employees who had not opted for enhanced pension coverage prior to the 2014 amendments will now given four months time to join. And the court also struck down a requirement in the 2014 amendments. The amendment required that employees who go beyond the salary threshold of Rs 15,000 per month should contribute monthly to the pension scheme at the rate of 1.16% of their salary. The court said that the particular amendment is not valid. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion, let's learn about Article 142 in detail. Before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. First of all, let's start with what is this Article 142 says. See, it talks about the enforcement of decrees and order of the Supreme Court. That is, during its exercise of jurisdiction, the Supreme Court may pass a decree or order that is necessary for doing complete justice in any case or matter pending before it. And this decree or order shall be enforceable throughout the Indian Territory. Thus, this article helps the Supreme Court a unique power to do complete justice between the parties. For example, a parliamentary law made with respect to this kind of Supreme Court's order can secure the attendance of any person, the discovery or production of any documents or the investigation or punishment of any contempt of itself. With these basics, now let us learn the background of the extraordinary power of Supreme Court. See this article 142 was originally numbered as article 118 in the draft constitution developed by the drafting committee. And note that it was framed from the article 210 of the Government of India Act 1935 with a slight modification and it was passed without debate in the constituent assembly. This is because everyone agreed to guarantee judicial independence to the nation's highest court that is the Supreme Court. This is about the background. Now let's see how this article 142 is being used. Firstly, it allows Supreme Court to supersede the executive and legislative branches. Here the Supreme Court will use the power guaranteed under article 142 to act as a legislator. Yes, they have the power to struck down certain provisions or the amendment provisions of the act or rules. Secondly, this article 142 is complemented by several articles. First is article 32. See it talks about right to constitutional remedies. Here through article 32 citizens can seek for enforcement of rights either in Supreme Court or High Court. So for enforcement of rights Supreme Court through article 142 can provide a complete justice. Then article 141. 
which says that the Supreme Court's decision shall be binding on all courts within India. As we all know that the Article 142 is an extraordinary power of the Supreme Court to enforce its orders or decree. And when Article 141 comes in, it is an add-on to Supreme Court to ensure the enforcement. Then comes Article 136, which talks about the special U petition. Now, what does this special U petition mean? See, a special U petition holds a prime place in the Indian judicial system because it provides the aggrieved party a special permission to be heard in apex court in appeal against any judgment or order of any court or tribunal in the Indian territory. Thus, we can say that this helps or complements the Supreme Court to use its powers referred as in the Article 142, that is the enforcement of order or decree. Then we can say that the enforcement of Supreme Court's order is a kind of judicial activism. Now what does this term judicial activism means? See, it is the exercise of the power of judicial review to set aside government acts. That is, the Supreme Court has frequently overridden laws that has been passed by the parliament in order to provide complete justice. For example, take the ban on liquor sale on highways case. Yes, in the year 2016, the Supreme Court under Article 142 made it illegal to sell alcohol within 500 meters of the highways outside edge. This decision was made to avoid accidents caused by drunk driving. So this is an example of using extraordinary powers by the Supreme Court under Article 142. I hope now you could be able to understand the Article 142. Now you will see the scope of this Article 142. Though Article 142's powers are broad, the Supreme Court has clarified their scope and extent over time in its various decisions. Firstly, Article 142 does not give the Supreme Court the power to contravene with the Article 32. Then Article 142 is only of supplementary nature. This means that the Supreme Court cannot substitute any substantial law or create something new which never was in existence. So these are all some of the scope of Article 142. Now let's see the advantages of Article 142. Firstly, whenever the executive or legislature fails to defend people's rights and uphold constitutional ideals, the judiciary has used its power under Article 142. Then as the constitutional protector, Article 142 gives Supreme Court the capacity to fill statutory gaps. Then the Article 142 also establishes a system of checks and balances for the government's other branches. For instance, the Supreme Court established a norms to safeguard a woman from sexual harassment at workplace. See the norms were established in the case law of Vishaga vs. State of Rajasthan. Then in the Bandhua Mukti Morcha case, the Supreme Court of India handed down a landmark verdict on India's bonded labor system. So these are all some of the advantages. But the Article 142 has some disadvantages as well. Firstly, the Supreme Court's power under Article 142 is not accountable. See, the executive and legislature are always accountable to their actions, right? But the power of Supreme Court under Article 142 is not accountable to the people. Then the majority of petitions or appeals brought before the Supreme Court are frequently rejected. See, in this case also, the Supreme Court is not required to explain why the petitions are rejected. Then the public faith in the government's integrity, quality and efficiency can be eroded by frequent court interference. So these are all some of the advantages of Article 142. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about Article 142 of the Indian Constitution, then the background, why it was created and the scope of Article 142 and some of the advantages and disadvantages. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Let's take up this news article. It reports that the army has approved five project sanction orders for the development of technology by the Indian industry under the Mark II route category of Defense Procurement Plan. In this context, let's learn about the Make in India scheme relating to defense industry in India. First of all, let's see in brief about Make in India scheme. See, Make in India is a major national program of the government of India designed to facilitate investment, then to foster innovation, enhancing skill development, protecting the intellectual property and to build best in-class manufacturing infrastructure in the country. And the primary objective of this initiative is to attract investments from across the globe and strengthen India's manufacturing sector. So this is all about the basics of Make in India scheme. Now coming to the defense production, in the aspect of pushing for Atma Nirbar Bharat, the Ministry of Defence has signed many agreements with the Indian industry to boost defence production in India. Under the Make in India Defence Scheme, the centre has notified three lists of projects 
such as make 1, make 2 and make 3. Now let's see briefly about all these three types. See projects under make 1 will involve government funding of 90% and these funds are released in a phased manner and based on the progress of the scheme to the industries. Under this scheme, the projects are done for Army and Air Force in the aspect of critical communication systems and security devices. Now coming to the Mark II category, these projects deals with manufacturing of prototypes, systems and subsystems that is mainly for import substitution or as innovative solutions. See they are funded by domestic manufacturers. Note the difference here, the Make 1 project is funded by government in the process of production while the Make 2 project is funded by the industry itself. Now talking about Make 3 category, it was introduced in October 2020. Similar to Make 2 projects, Make 3 projects deals with production of defense prototypes, systems and subsystems. However, these will not be designed or developed indigenously, but it is manufactured in India as import substitution. In these projects, an Indian vendor can enter into a joint venture with a foreign original equipment manufacturer. So these are all the subtypes under Make in India Defense Scheme. That's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about Make in India Scheme and also about the subtypes under Make in India Defense Program. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It talks about Delhi smog. The Chief Minister of Delhi has called out that this smog was due to the effects of stubble burning in the neighboring states. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about the reasons behind Delhi smog. We have seen about stubble burning in our discussion previously on 26th October 2022. So, we are not going to cover about stubble burning today. Instead, now let's focus on other reasons for the smog formation in Delhi. As we all know, Delhi is a congested city with high human population. There is also a flow of high migrant population into the Delhi from the north and eastern parts of our country. With high population comes high emissions. So, this is one of the reasons for the smog formation over Delhi. Secondly, Delhi has an inland location unlike other metros in India like Mumbai or Chennai. So, due to its inland geography, moderating effect of the sea which helps the other metros in controlling the air pollution cannot provide any help to Delhi. Here the term moderating effect means the sea breeze and the land breeze which blows alternatively that pulls the pollution present in the city. Moving on, winters in Delhi are harsh unlike Calcutta or Chennai. This is the reason for temperature inversion which happens frequently in the months of November and December in Delhi. Here, temperature inversion prevents the pollution present in the air from vertical mixing. As a result of this, heavy smog heads formed in the lower reaches of the atmosphere during cold winter months in and around Delhi. And the foremost reason is lack of government spending on public infrastructure according to the increase in the city's population. For example, Delhi's public transport infrastructure lacks rapid transit lanes for public buses. See the rapid transit lanes helps in the faster movement of public buses and it encourages people to use public buses thereby reducing the movement of personal vehicles. So this is one of the example that how Delhi lacks in public infrastructure. That's all regarding this discussion. This discussion we saw about the reasons for smog formation in Delhi other than stubble burning. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Look at this first question, consider the following statements with respect to Amur Falcons. Let's take up the first statement, they are one of the longest flying migratory birds which covers a distance of about 20,000 kilometers. See this statement is absolutely correct as we see in the discussion while migrating from Siberia to South Africa, the Amur Falcons covers a longest distance of about 22,000 kilometers. So statement 1 is correct. Coming to the second statement, under the IUCN red list, they are categorized as vulnerable. See this statement is wrong because Amur falcons are placed under the category of least concern in the IUCN red list of endangered species. So statement 2 is wrong. Now coming to the third statement, they are protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. See this statement is also wrong because they are included in Schedule 4 of the Wildlife Protection Act and not Schedule 1. So third statement is also wrong. Now the question asks for correct statement. So the correct answer for the question is option A, one only. Moving on, let's take up the second question. With reference to India's intended nationally determined contribution to UN C, consider the following statements. See, first of all, let's know about intended nationally determined contributions. 
C it is the initiative that are pledged by nations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It comes under the auspices of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now coming to the first statement, India to be net zero country by 2070. See this statement is correct. Under the intended nationally determined contributions, India pledged to become net zero emission country by 2070. So statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the second statement, 50% of India's energy requirements is to be produced from renewable energy by 2040. See this statement is incorrect because the year is here wrongly given. And India is planned to achieve this goal by 2030 and not 2040. So this statement is wrong. See there are also three other nationally determined contribution of India. They are firstly to reach 500 gigawatt non-fossil energy capacity by 2030. Then secondly reduction of the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons by 2030. And finally the reduction of the carbon intensity of the economy by 45% by 2030 over 2005 levels. Now coming to the question which of the statements given above is are correct. As we know statement 1 is alone correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A one only. Now coming to the third question consider the following statements with respect to electronically transmitted postal ballot system. Let's take up the first statement. It is a system that enables eligible voters to cast their votes from outside their original constituency. See this is what we discussed in our discussion. See it is the foremost objective of electronically transmitted postal ballot system. So statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the second statement, member of armed forces of India who employed within India alone will be eligible to vote through ETPBS. See this statement is wrong. As we saw in discussion, the member of armed forces who are employed outside India are also eligible to vote through ETPBS. So statement 2 is wrong. Coming to the third statement, the wife of a service voter is also eligible to vote through ETPBS. See this statement is correct. Under section 20 of the representation of people like 1950, the wife of a service voter is also considered as an honorary residing citizen of her constituency. So she is eligible to vote through ETPBS. So statement 3 is correct. Here the question asks for correct statements. So the answer for the question is option C 1 and 3 only. Now coming to the fourth question with reference to make in India scheme consider the following statements. Let's take up the first statement. It is a scheme led by Ministry of Defense to increase defense indigenization. Here it talks about Make in India scheme and not Make in India scheme of defense sector. And this Make in India scheme is led by Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade which is under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So statement 1 is wrong. Now coming to the second statement, one of the objectives of Make in India is to increase the manufacturing sector growth by 12 to 14 percentage. This statement is correct. It is one of the objectives of Make in India scheme. I will list out some other objectives. Please watch carefully. The foremost objective is to create 100 million additional jobs in the manufacturing sector by the year 2020. Then to increase the manufacturing sector's share in the GDP to 25% by 2022. Then creating required skill sets among the urban poor and the rural migrants to foster inclusive growth. And then a rise in the domestic value addition and technological depth in the manufacturing sector. And the development in the country should be environmentally sustainable. So these are all the objectives that Make in India scheme strives to. Now coming to the question, which of the statements given above is are correct? Here statement 2 alone is correct. So the correct answer for the question is option B, 2 only. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. And displayed here are the two main questions for your practice. Go through the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this we come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.